Okay, well, I want to. Okay, uh, Russian 160, your class is the lecture. Um, but I am going to email out a question after the lecture uh, that you'll just have to respond short, a very short response uh, via email to me by the end of the day. Uh, so just uh, plan to do that. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll, will we have time for a few minutes? Yes. Okay. Uh, feel free to ask any of your questions later. But I'll turn it over to Dr. Burko, uh, Dr. Lucy, and I'll turn it over to Leonard Hammer. <laughs> 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 okay. well, this is fun. Like I know. This is a lot of fun. Like hot potato. Okay. Um, is, it, is it working? Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Awesome. All right. <laughs> well, welcome everybody. Sorry we got a little bit late, but we're uh, I think it'll, it'll definitely pay off. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing to you Professor Anton Burkhoff uh, from the University of the Rals, uh, coming here. He's also representing his own strategic litigation center, which is an NGO that he started uh, that will, he'll be describing a lot of the work that the SLC, that the strategic litigation center does. I had the pleasure of working, I had the pleasure of working with Professor Burkhoff for close to 10 years now. And um, he's actually here on a research development grant at, at the University of Arizona, uh, specifically to work with our MA program in human rights practice to develop um, dual language programming between his university and our, uni our university here. And uh, his specialty is human rights. He's worked in incredible cases, which he'll be talking about today. And uh, with that, I'll give the floor to Professor Burkhoff. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, I will use both hands to navigate. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for coming here today. Uh, I wanted to share with you today uh, the Russian, Russian experience, experience of uh, my colleagues, my own experience on how we deal our regular, usual common citizens use European Convention of Human, of human Rights, how they apply to the European Court of Human Rights to protect their rights, to defend their rights, and how we actually strategically, strategically litigate cases, how we bring international human rights home. Uh, a few words about the NGO uh, Strategic Litigation Center. It, the idea of this NGO was flying around for some time. We formally set up this center last year. Its goal is to uh, strategically litigate complicated cases to be able to bring a big impact which can have consequences not just for the client, uh, not for the applicant in the particular case, but uh, touch the entire class of people. Sometimes it's entire Russia and even foreign citizens. Uh, another goal of this organization is to share this experience. Uh, that's why we published books. <laughs> I have uh, a couple of books with me in Russian. Uh, some literature is in English I can share with you. It's all free. I'm going to donate these books to the library. And also uh, through lecturing. And the recent initiative, together with your uh, university, uh, uh, online trainings. So we actually break boundaries uh, that people all over from Russia can be, uh, is able to learn this experience how to bring cases. So strategic litigation or impact litigation, as I said, uh, is um, equipped to influence an uh, uh, unlimited number of circle of people. And the, the main goal of strategic litigation is not to win in the court of law, but to win in the court of minds of people. So you have to capture the attention of the people, judges, journalists, politicians, and then the change might happen. It's never happening like this. Imagine how, how, how many years it took for the Brown versus Board of Education to come around. Many, many cases, many, many years. So it's the same here. So social change, the bigger social change that we're trying to bring is we're trying to 
make this change in the mind of lawyers that international European human rights law, it's not for in, an international court to use. It's for the national courts, a peace court uh, a judge, uh, a district court judge, to apply international treaties in, in, its, uh, in his or her decisions. And we do this since 1998, since Russia ratified the European Convention. So uh, it's, last February, it was uh, 23 years since Russia ratified, uh, became um, a member of the Council of Europe. Uh, it's an international organization. Uh, it's, it's, some people uh, mix it with, uh, uh, confuse it with the uh, European Union. It's absolutely different organization. It's not an economic union, it's a polit political union. And the aim is to uphold human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. It was founded in 1994. Uh, it has 47 member states, uh, budget half million, half, half billion, and Russia contributes 30 uh, million per year. But the last two years, Russia refused to pay this uh, contribution. That's a separate story. Uh, sorry, we do not have time to, this, to discuss this. Uh, this is the anthem of the Europe, uh, EU, and the Council of Europe has the same flag, the same anthem. Sorry, there's no sound here. And there's a hip-hop version. Sorry you don't hear it. It's kind of fun. Uh, so there are three main uh, organs of, of, this, uh, in, council, of the Council of Europe. Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Committee of Ministers, executing uh, organ, consists of ministers, foreign ministers, the deputies, and the European Court of Human Rights. And we speak more about the European Court of Human Rights. That's the building, it's called Human Rights Building. Uh, this is a courtroom. Unfortunately, hearing, hearings do not take place very often. It's all in written exchange of memos. So what the European Court of Human Rights do? Uh, it's an international court based in Strasbourg, like the, all the organs of the uh, uh, Council of Europe. Uh, it consists of uh, judges, each one coming from each member state. But those judges are independent. They do not represent a particular country, like a Russian judge do not does not represent Russia. Uh, uh, of course, there is a secretariat, uh, also consists of independent lawyers. <clears throat> uh, it was established by the European Convention on Human Rights. It's an international treaty, uh, which only member states of the Council of Europe can ratify. U.S. cannot be a member of the European, uh, the European Convention. So it's uh, established the European Court, and it listed the Convention lists uh, rights that are protected by the, the by this Convention. Not all of the rights possible are incorporated in the European Convention. So that's why, to my clients, I say sometimes the European Convention cannot do anything for you. <clears throat> These are the list of rights. It's, uh, starts from the right to life, freedom from torture, inhuman and degrading treatment, uh, all the political rights, some of the economic rights too, uh, right to be uh, elected, also protected, but on a very limited uh, way. But it, it is there. So what does the European Court do? It applies the European Convention if member states failed to apply this uh, guarantees within the national legal system. Um, basically, European Court issues judgments which are legally binding on other states. I often compare this with U.S. Supreme Court. Its judgments are legally binding for each state of the United States of America. So it's very, very much similar. It can issue a uh, judgment uh, can give compensations. They can be from 1,000 euros to a billion. Uh, the, the biggest number they awarded was 
to the oil company Yukos, almost two billion euros. <clears throat> it can also prescribe changes in the national law, which is very controversial because of the uh, sovereignty, the notion of the sovereignty. Individual measures, European court can prescribe that somebody is to be released from a prison. This is a system how the particular case go around the different divisions of the court. A single judge can consider very simple issues like inadmissibility. Three judges can uh, consider a very simple case on a very well-established case law. Uh, usually seven judges, a chamber of seven judges consider cases. And the grand chamber is for the most important cases which uh, might change the case law of the entire court. And the most important question is when we can apply to the European Court of Human Rights. There are very complicated rules of, inadmiss of admissibility. Unfortunately, 95% of all the applications go coming to the European Court of Human Rights are inadmissible because applicants, their lawyers, do not often follow these rules. But the most important rules, rule is we can apply to the European Court after exhausting domestic remedies. Uh, this is the main idea. You first try it in the National Court and then you go to the European Court of Human Rights. So uh, this is the main idea of the European Convention and of the end of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, most of the lawyers forget that European Convention actually starts with Article One, not right, Article Two, Right to Life. And Article One set up this major rule that member states, the, the high contracting parties which ratify the European Convention, they shall secure the rights enshrined in the European Convention at the domestic level. And when Russia ratified the convention in May 1998, not many lawyers understood the idea of the European Convention. Everybody, or majority of the people, lawyers, real, thought that, okay, Russia ratified the European Convention, now we have a right to apply to the European Court of Human Rights. No. First of all, you've got a right to use European Convention at the domestic level. And the European Convention is not just the text, it's a train of case law judgments of the European Court of Human Rights, which interpret the text of the European Convention. So that's the tool that every lawyer has can use. So that's what we were doing by litigating cases. We're trying, in addition to just the particular goal to win a particular case, to, uh, to change a particular legislation, we would educate judges and lawyers to the simple idea that the European court is a secondary. First of all, you have to go to the national courts. And the case law of the European Court of Human Rights is legally binding in interpreting the convention, and they are legally, legally binding for Russian judges. And it was very important to do this because you can see through this example, uh, this is the interview uh, online interview which a chief justice of regional court in Yekaterinburg conducted in 2004 and I asked this judge whether they organize any trainings for lower judges on the European Convention and he said no, it's not necessary. All we need is to apply national law. That's the most funny thing is this interview press conference was called Judges Shall Know Everything. <laughs> probably not the European Convention. And another interesting fact that in 2003, this court, this particular court, was in, responsible for one of the first judgments of the European Court against Russia, where a woman was held in psychiatric hospital for 40 days. She was treated with very heavy medicine without a court decision. And that's, that's why, because it happened because they applied Russian law, not the European Convention. 
<clears throat> so we use strategy to bring down resistance to the European Convention. I remember 1998, 99, when I would come to the judge and argue the case based on the European Convention and the case law, and the judge would say, stop, one more time you mention the convention, you're going to be out of my room, of the courtroom. We, we're here not to just apply foreign law. The understanding was that the European Convention is a foreign law, it's not a national law. So you really have to make an effort to make this shift in the minds. So we were arguing cases, if they are not successful at the national level, we'll bring the case to the European Court and then come back with the judgment of the European Court and educate judges once again. We do, we do this through education, we organize a special offline school, we call it Ural's International Human Rights School. We will train uh, Russian uh, litigators, young lawyers, to these uh, ideas, publishing books, speaking at conferences. And there, were, there was a progress. Many NGOs in Russia picked up this idea of using European Convention at the national level. So many NGOs started to do this, and the impact was much more uh, w much wider. Before 2003, very little cases were where judges applied the European Convention. For example, Supreme Court never actually referred to the case law. But if you re refer to the Convention without looking into the case law, that's a wrong way of applying it, because you have no idea what you're doing. But then, today, Supreme Court, Constitutional Court of Russia use the European Convention very well, sometimes, with very good examples, even in, in, in the cases that I'm going to talk about today. And Anatoly Kovler is a former judge who served at the, at the court of the European Court for 12 years. He, he studied many, many cases from coming from national courts, and he arrived at this conclusion. The further you are from Moscow, the better courts apply the European Convention. He said that at the conference where the chief justice of the Moscow city court was present. And this judge wasn't so happy about this conclusion. <clears throat> but there is no progress if the case is about changing the Russian law, if application of the European Convention will bring law reform, will bring uh, reform of the judicial practice. And if the cases are sensitive, like transplantology, uh, like right of lifers, you can read it, life of, uh, right of terrorists. Very many ter life prisoners are accused, uh, convicted terrorists. Let, uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to speak, uh, share with you um, two cases. They are all about bio bioethical issues. I call this, it's a set of cases, it's not just two cases, it's uh, two sets of many, many cases on two issues, right to uh, artificial insemination and conjugal meetings, it's the right of uh, prisoners and their family, family members, and another case, on the, it, we call it secret organ harvesting case. Although those cases are absolutely different, different issues, but there are a number of features which um, uh, common for those cases. Those issues has never been considered by the European Court of Human Rights against Russia. So there is no judgment like Petrov versus Russia on the right of on conjugal meetings. Uh, but those issues were considered by the European Court against other states. But according to the position of the Russian Supreme Court, even if the judgment of the European Court is against like UK or Poland, it's still legally binding on Russia if the same issues are at, at stake. So Russian judges have to take into account even cases against other states. Applicants uh, have a case only if they rely on the European Convention. If they look at the Russian law, Russian law doesn't protect them, doesn't protect their rights. If result, all of those cases, if resolved under the European Convention, it means it will bring changes to the Russian law or practice. And issues are sensitive. Uh, 
transplantation, right of lifers. So what strategies did we use? The same. We would put an obvious question before a judge. It's a balance. On the one hand, there is a Russian law. On the other hand, is a European convention. And under the Russian constitution, if there is a contradiction between Russian law and the European convention, a judge shall apply European law. So it's, it's very easy for a judge to decide. But in practice, it's not very easy. Uh, usually, judges very much hesitate to apply European Convention in these kind of cases. And we record this hesitation, this behavior, how they try to um, substantiate their decision. Sometimes the, the judgments are funny. Uh, we package this reaction into the application to the European Court of Human Rights and, and wait for European judges to evaluate this and then come back to the national courts again. We engage the media, we teach, we publish, and sometimes we bring defendants to the conference, like what happened in the case of organ harvesting case. Uh, and the first case is a conjugal meeting case and artificial insemination. It's called Karalov's case. The family of Karalov's brought this case. But before that, I will speak about... So 1997, there was a new law on the rights of prisoners, and this law said there is no right to conjugal meetings during the first 10 plus years of serving the sentence. It's called strict regime, no meetings. There is only, they were only allowed to have four hours meetings through the glass, through the, through the bars. Uh, so we have this couple approaching uh, the Harkins, uh, the Harkins. Uh, her, husband was convicted criminal for life. Uh, she wanted to have a child from him anyway. Um, but the new law didn't allow them any conjugal meetings. So they wanted to challenge that. We took this case to the Russian Constitutional Court before, back then, 10 years ago, it was possible to bring a case right to the Supreme Constitutional Court. And the Constitutional Court said, it's absolutely ignored the right of, of the wife. There were applica two applications, I mean, one application on behalf of two people, the prison, uh, prisoner and the, the free woman, who not accused, not a not convicted person. And the Constitutional Court said, the prisoner may be limited in the possibility of having a child. So in, imprisonment means uh, rejection of all the rights. And then there was this Khoroshenko. He didn't have a uh, wife. He just wanted to have conjugal meetings with his family members, father, mother, just spend a few days together in one room, talk, touch each other, enjoy the company. And the court said he may be limited in family life. So we created bad precedents. What do we do? We wait for new applicants to come over and try to overcome this. Unfortunately, sorry, the first case, the Harkin case, was didn't was not accepted by the European Court of Human Rights. But Harashenka was, and we will come to this later. Uh, so in 2003, Karolov's family approached us, and knowing our bad precedent that we created four years ago, uh, ten years ago, we thought, we're not going to go to the court asking for conjugal meetings. It's obvious. Law against us, constitutional court is against us. We will ask for the right to artificial insemination. If the state doesn't allow them to have sex, to conceive a child in, through natural ways, let them do it artificially. And one more thing I didn't mention. Back in 2004, we didn't have any case law of the European Court on this issue, on the right to conjugal meetings or artificial insemination. But in 2013, we already have a, had a judgment, uh, uh, Dixon versus UK of 2007, where, where the court, European Court said, a couple, absolutely similar situation, lifer, prisoners, and free wife, they have a right to artificial insemination. 
but that was against the UK. Well, we use this case to bring a case to the national courts, to the district court on the right to artificial insemination, and we lost it again. Uh, Russian judge, the district court judge said, this is not a case against the Russia, so it's not applicable. It absolutely contradicts to the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court. We, 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 will, we were exhausting domestic remedies, going through different appeals, and at the stage of the Supreme Court, we learned about Koroshenko versus Russia case. That's the guy who lost the case just 10 years ago in the Constitutional Court. And the Grand Chamber, 17 judges of the U European Court of Human Rights, decided that no conjugal meetings for 10 years is a violation of the right to family life and private life. Two judges, including Russian one, uh, had a separate opinion saying it's not only a violation of right to family life, it's all, it's all, it is also in itself, it's in human treatment. Ten years without possibility of touching your mother or mother touching uh, his, her son. Uh, so we got this judgment, translated it into Russian, all the judgments of the European Court or are in English or French. We translated it, published in the, in the World Journal, <clears throat> and we sent a letter to the head of the prison of where Karolov was held, asking for a co one conjugal meeting based on the Euro case law, on the Harshenka case. The head of the prison said, no, uh, it's not necessary. Just in 10 years, you will get this right. Why bother now? <laughs> so we took this rejection and appealed it before district court. But this time we were asking, in 2004 we were asking for artificial insemination, but this time we were asking for right to conjugal meetings based on the case. And this time we won in the district court level. I was absolutely amazed. I didn't expect it at all, but the, a district court judge has a, a nerve was, she was so brave to issue a judgment which contradicted the, the case law of the Constitutional Court. She directly applied Harashenko versus Russia. Unfortunately, Moscow City Court, as the former ECHR judge uh, Kovler mentioned, uh, Moscow City Court overruled. And we decided to go to the Constitutional Court. Uh, once again, 11 years after we went, 12 years after, years later, we went to the Constitutional Court once again. Uh, again, this is another strategy. We also found three more families who brought the case to the Constitutional Court. Uh, we did it in case that if for some reason Carlos do not want to continue, so we have a sort of backup of other applicants. Um, so the Constitutional Court in 2016 ruled in favor of the family, of the of Karolev's family. And it overruled its own position, 12 years old position. And then I remember this day when <clears throat> uh, I was sitting at the desk composing the application to the Constitutional Court and I was thinking, how do I convince 19 judges of this highest court to overrule its opinion, which they had 20, 20, 12 years ago. And in the case where one of the applicant is a terrorist. And then I thought, I don't want to argue with them. Let them argue, so constitutional court judges argue with the 17 judges of the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights. So basically, literally copied and paste arguments from the judgment of the European Court into the application and send it to the Constitutional Court. And they beautifully applied the ECHR arguments. Everything was, to my students, I mentioned this case as a good example of Russian courts following the judgment of the European Court. In this judgment, uh, Constitutional Court allowed all lifers, not just the applicants, one conjugal meeting per year without 
in need of waiting for a change in the legislation. But there were negative side of the judgment. And it's only visible to those who know what is the application, the text of the application. And the application we asked, we actually put before judges two sets of facts, one which led to the right to artificial insemination and one to the right to uh, conjugal meetings. The facts about artificial insemination were absolutely omitted by the judges. They, they just ignored them. They, they only ruled on the right to conjugal meetings. <coughs> they refused reconsideration of Karlov's case, so no right to artificial insemination. And they awarded legal expenses, very little, 10,000 rubles. If you calculate, it's a little bit more than $100. So imagine 12 years of litigation, uh, a lot of uh, uh, work hours, and you get this $100. So this was a clear message to strategic litigators from the Constitution Court. If once again you will come to us after 12 years of litigation, all you will get is a compensation of one hour of work. So that's the negative side of this beautiful judgment. The consequences of all the lifers, 100, 1,800, uh, and their family members received the right to conjugal meetings. The, the, the law was changed. New dorms are being built to accommodate visitors. Uh, she went to meet her husband for the first time. Uh, and uh, there are stories, and I know it from Veronika Karalova, that some of the couples were able actually to conceive a child. Imagine one time a year, bingo. <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't work for Karalova and for other families, and they're still waiting for this, judge, for this judgment on uh, right to artificial insemination. Uh, reasons why we think constitutional court ruled in favor of Karolov. I think Constitutional Court didn't want to argue with uh, European Court of Human Rights if they rule that it's okay uh, 10 years without any meetings, they would look very much inhumane. But the most important is the politics. One year before this judgment, there was a judgment by the same court, Constitutional Court, and it says that they have a right to pick and choose which judgments of the European Court of Human Rights are applicable in Russia and which are not. And then there was a Yukos case, the 2 billion euros case, where the Constitutional Court, just six months before the Lowe's case, when, where the Constitutional Court said, this judgment is not applicable in Russia. We're not going to pay 2 billion euros. And they, I think they used Karolov's case as a good example. Look, we're not bad guys. Forget about Yukos. Look at the Karolov's case. We beautifully applied everything, all the standards that the European Court developed up till now. So we're waiting for the judgment any day now. We never know when they will come with, with, the, with the judgment. Um, and now, this is the second case. Uh, not so much successful as Karolov's case, but not less interesting. The secret organ harvesting case, a set of cases we call Alina Sablina case. So what happened? Uh, in 2014, Alina Sablina, a young 19 years old student, was hit by a car on zebra crossing. She spent five days in the hospital in a coma. Her parents arrived right away and five days spent next to her. They spoke to doctors every single day, twice a day. And the day on the day Alina died, uh, they were not allowed to see her daughter. And six hours later, uh, they learned that Alina died. One month later, her mother, really by, by chance, learned that six organs were harvested from her body, from the, from the body of her daughter. And four of the six organs were missing. There, there was an autopsy report that the body does not have six organs, and there was a list of organ harvested, the document, which says that the transplantologist, transplantology surgeon, removed only two organs, heart and, and kidneys. 
So it means that four organs just disappeared. And the most important for this case, there was no record that Alina actually expressed her willingness to be donor, or there's no record that she said no. Uh, parents were never approached by doctors to ask what does Alina think about being a donor. I thought maybe she said something about it before, and they never ask relatives, the mother and father, what do they think about? It? Would they allow? Uh, donation. And we got this letter from Elena Sand. This is how we learned about this case. We got a, a bulk letter. Uh, probably she was looking for any NGO, a lawyer, to help her to find out what's going on in the Russian medical system. And that's what she wrote to us saying, What does it mean for her to learn that the organs were harvested in secret? For her, it's like. Uh, to bury her child for the second time. This is how it's painful, inhumane, degrading, degrading treatment. Uh, this is Alina. She was 19, studying in Moscow. So we try to find out what's going on. We look at the Russian law. We never knew that this law exists. Why, why should you bother to know? And there is a law on, uh, there is a law on transplantation, Article 8. It's called presumed consent. And the, 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 the meaning of this provision is that uh, trans removal of organ cannot be, is not allowed if the healthcare institution at the same time of the removal was informed that this person or relatives were against the removal. So this is the key words. If the healthcare institution was informed, passive. Healthcare institution, first of all, what is healthcare institution? Who? Who exactly? You can't approach the building, the institution. You have to approach somebody. The law doesn't say anything about this. Second of all, it's passive. It's just sit and wait that somebody approach probably doctors, but parents never, relatives never approach doctors with objection or because they have no idea that the, the loved one is considered as a potential donor. So what happened with, in Alina's case? During the first hour Alina was in the hospital, the, the doc, uh, a doctor called transplantology department and said, institution said, we have a potential donor, Alina Sablin, get ready. But she, this, the same doctor that didn't do anything to inform the parents. <clears throat> Surprisingly, it's not, a, it, it's not a secret that doctors, um, basically doctors say, yes, we are not required to actively ask for consent of the relatives. We just sit and wait. That's the famous Russian doctor said this. And it's, he said it in a documentary aired in the, one of the major channels. So I'm thinking, why are they not hiding this? Why are you so open about this? Because of the judgment of the Constitutional Court of 2003, which considered a very similar case back then. And it says, basically, it's inhumane to inform. It is inhumane to put the question of harvesting organs to a person, relatives, at the time when they learn about the death. So if you follow this logic, it's okay to remove in secret. Just Nobody knows, less problems. But then we started European Convention on Human Rights and the case law, and we found two, at least two cases, now there are only two cases, against Latvia. Very similar case. If you change the name of the applicant to Alina Sablina and Latvia, if you put Russia instead of Latvia, it's absolutely the same cases. And we learned that to doing the same thing like they did in Alina's case, it's in human and degrading treatment and it's violation of the right of family uh, to decide what to do with the organs. And we went we brought a case to the Russian courts, 
district court, and then we went all the, to all the appeals. And now we have the case is pending before the European Court of Human Rights. Um, <clears throat> so Judge Shemekina, the district court judge said, this is a Latvian case, so I do not apply it. But most interesting was that some months later, already after the appeal, I happened to meet this judge in the court, and she started the conversation. She approached me and said, and asked me, what, so what are you going to do in this case? And suddenly you can just see that this is a real person in front of you, not, not the judge. She, she was kind of smiling, not smiling, but human face. And she was naturally interested in what you're going to do in this case. And said, yet yeah, what, I, what I promised in my closing arguments, we're going to go to the Constitutional Court, the European Court. And she says, please do. Uh, I could not rule otherwise if I was not told so from above. It doesn't clear, it's not clear what is above. Russian higher courts or the European court or the phone call, I don't know. But that's what she said to me. And Moscow city courts, all the upper courts, uphold this judgment. And the argument was the same. It's not against Russia, it's against Latvia. So here's the case before the European Court of Human Rights. We have a number of issues before the judge, not only about organ harvesting, but also in, uh, about how the case was conducted, uh, how considered. And the judgment is expected any day. Uh, a few days I was interviewed by New York Times correspondents. I don't know if they will come up with this article uh, story. Probably they're waiting for the European Court of Human Rights to, to deliver the judgment. Uh, I had a sort of information that the uh, European Court is going to consider to issue the judgment this month. But you never know. So what is our uh, next step, find more victims. It's very difficult to find more victims. Over the five years, I was able to find only five victims, and only three of them wanted to go to the court. The reason is that everything is done in secret, so people don't usually know that they are their relatives without organs. So it doesn't mean every single transplantation, every single removal of organs in Russia are right now happening in secret because relatives have no idea what's happening. So we want to win the case in the European court and then come back to the national court to do the same thing that we did in Karlov's case, to face Russian judges with the European Court of Human Rights judges and keep winning in the course of minds of the people. The keys to the success in, in both cases, European Court of Human Rights, it's, it's important to have access to this court I know it's probably as important for you to have access to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, not without the polit political uh, opportunity, like what happened in Carlos' case. Media is very important. Uh, I was surprised how media was in favor of Alina Sablin and family. Because you usually expect that nobody will criticize especially our media, not very free and open, criticize uh, the way transplantology is functioning right now. And they were very much in favor of the applicants and questioning. So educating us lawyers, we, we run the Euros International Human Rights School offline courses now. We're starting this online courses. It's very important because I was able to find other applicants for other cases through my students because they will hear a news report and they will send me a link. Uh, right now we are uh, litigating case in national courts, Mardari versus, is going to be versus Russia. It's a, it's a foreigner. His organs were removed while he was in Russia. And I learned this from Alina, Yelena Sablin. She sent me a link to a news. I found a journalist and the journalist told me how to find the applicant. And educating judges. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to find more, 
this is a book. This one, uh, it's in Russian. It's actually edited by me and my colleague from the U.S. Uh, it can, it has four American stories, strategic litigation stories. It's not a legal uh, article story. Uh, it's uh, it's it's interesting to read. Actually, there is no quotation, no footnotes, and four Russian stories, including the two that I shared with you today, in more detail here. And if you do not speak Russian, you can read this. Uh, it's in English. It's a chapter in the Cambridge University Press book. It's my chapter, the draft chapter, so I can share it. You can just scan it or email me, and I can share it with you later. Thank you. I think we'll take some questions uh, from the audience, uh, if there are any. Uh, by all means, just raise your hand and uh, yeah, some questions. Oh, there we are. People in the back are alive. You want to just stand up and just... Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Uh, not, yeah, can if you share, can, we'll bring in the microphone. Um, can you share with us um, uh, some stories of um, journalists and issues involving journalists? that have come before the European court? Um, and have they, um, are they getting resolved on a domestic level? Yes. Um, you, even on this case, I, because of limited time, I didn't mention that this case of Sablina was considered in closed chambers. So basically all the journalists were removed from the courtroom. The excuse was that the judge was protecting the right of Alina to uh, medical secret. Although this case was not about how she was treated in the hospital in terms of like healing her. It was all about whether judges informed parents had they had an opportunity to do so. But the judge closed it because nobody wants that public to learn how transplantation is taking, how, how does it work? The old, uh, we have two journalists who were, were willing to sue. Basically, there was no domestic remedies. We brought two cases right to the European Court of Human Rights. And now they're being considered. It's a very long process. Uh, there are a number of cases on Article 10, right to freedom of expression and right to seek for information. There is a very successful NGO in this area, Mass Media Center. Uh, Galina Arapo is the head of this NGO. I can introduce you to her if you want. So there are a number of uh, interesting cases, uh, winning cases. But it's very hard to... European Convention is not a panacea. If the overall political atmosphere in, is that this way, it cannot changed it by just winning cases in the European Court of Human Rights. Will you moderate? <laughs> you sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just going to put, yeah, please. Uh, okay, I just wanted to follow up on, on that, on the point you just made. So once the European Court has made the decision, say they decide, no, the court should have been open, the journalist should have been allowed to observe the court, which of course was years ago. Right, but then that precedent has been set, and from then on, does Russia have to abide by the open, open court rulings? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. It does not necessarily mean that it will be like that, but it, it really depends on, on the follow up, how lawyers will argue, how they will use Sablina case in order to open the doors of the courtrooms. So in, in all cases, once the, the, the European court has made the decision, the domestic courts are supposed to follow that case law, that precedent, right? Yes. Do they ever have to change laws to do that? And yeah. Are they expected to do that? That's part of the convention. There are many examples when Russia changed the law, national law, and the judicial practice. Um, they always pay compensations, with one exception, the two billion case. Yeah. Uh, but uh, another within three months they pay compensations. 
it's more difficult with general measures like changing the law but it's still happening it's not perfect but it would have been it would have been much more difficult without the european court i'm sorry i'm just going to ask a tiny point because i'm a medical anthropologist and i'm interested in the medical ethics part of this was she deceased when her organs were harvested well that's a very very separate question when deciding what kind of case to bring we thought there's no chance we could establish whether she was treated enough was she actually brain dead the whole notion is brain dead it's very new it's since 1968 harvard 300 professors come up with this notion before death meant biological death but you can't harvest organs from a biologically dead person you have to sort of establish the brain death um, it's uh, we over the five years of litigation none of the Russian medical professionals came came forward to help us even anonymously we now have one sort of a uh, professional from Germany Russian speaking Russian educated um, we're thinking of trying to do something about this aspect of the case in the future. That's more more dangerous. Any other questions? Uh, if this can be done quickly, can you explain why Russia did not contribute the 30 million euro that it had committed to? Yeah. Uh, if it's, if very quickly after the Ukraine war in 2014, Russia was um, Russia could not vote in the parliamentary assembly. Russian delegation uh, could not vote uh, in the parliamentary assembly. And then after some times, the Russia made a move saying, "If we can't vote, we have no rights in this organ. Why shall we pay compensation? Oh, sir, pay." Uh, contributions and then according to the Euro, uh, Council of Europe rules if if a member state doesn't pay contribution for two years it shall be expelled so these two years expire expire in June this year so there should be some kind of a decision made other parliamentary assembly should make a move give them votes back uh, or Russia sh shall say okay We'll, we'll start paying uh, but I don't know much of the details uh, it's easy to find out in the media uh, some documents of the council of Europe okay what will happen you might do what's the loss of the game sorry what's the loss yes what do they lose that you asked yeah, what, yeah. They lose. yeah what, what would they lose? If well, they lose? we won't have access to the European Court of Human Rights. That's the most uh, loss we will have. We won't. Most of the changes that the Russian national legal system uh, experienced over the last 20 years, it was because of the European Court of Human Rights. I mean, most positive changes. <laughs> Uh, so, if we don't have European Court, I don't know what to do. Is there any disincentive for those who, let's say you want to keep the status quo in Russia and you want to keep the law the same, is there any disincentive for you to want to not, or for you to like want to stay in? The, uh, Sorry, I, I don't understand the question. Is there like any sort of disincentive um, for those who want to keep the status quo? Just from keeping them uh, from wanting to out of the European court. Uh, there are there are views that uh, Russia is just playing uh, blackmail. Wanted to get some uh, impositive decisions. Uh, it happened before in two thousand and six. Russia refused to ratify Protocol fourteen which reformed the European Court. For four years, it would not not ratify this convention. They would advance strange arguments why they don't uh, uh, 
ratify the European uh, this protocol, and then suddenly they ratified it. I don't know what happened. No, some maybe some political decisions were made. It was about the time when European Court of Human Rights considered Yuko's case and some other uh, politically se sensitive cases. So, I don't know how to basically answer your question. Sorry. Um, it was a young lady here. I was the same question. Same question, uh, Kelly. Yeah, I had, there, there was an interesting point that you made. Well, first, I thought it was really interesting that the judge felt comfortable to approach you and let you know that she. And nobody saw us. <laughs> <laughs> I figured as much. Yeah. Um, speaking about that judge, uh, and I wanted to talk a little bit. I wanted to get your opinion. Why the comment? The further from Moscow, the better the application of European Court of Human Rights. You could talk about why the regional courts would be able to apply the um, European Court of Human Rights rulings easier than the Moscow courts. Why? Yeah. Well, I guess uh, because they're further from Moscow, further from the oh, center, uh, less kind of fear that somebody will tell them what to do. Uh, when we were litigating Karolev's case, in parallel, we had another case from a far away region. And because we didn't have money to travel there for the, to represent the client, we instructed the client how, what to do. Uh, we already knew what to do because we went through this in Karolev's case. And the district court of this far away region, the judge was so brave, it's not only ruled that it was against the European Convention to reject the right to conjugal meeting, it actually said that this applicant has a right to get the one conjugal meeting. You can go to the prison and, and ask for this. So I think it's uh, yeah, less this sort of pressure. Yes, please. How is your work, work viewed by the Russian leadership? Um, in 2013, Russia uh, came up with a new law on foreign agents, NGOs. Um, maybe some of you know uh, about this. Basically, the idea is if an NGO receives foreign funding and does political activity, and the term of political activity is very vague. This NGO can be recognized as a foreign agent NGO. For, and the consequences is it's too much of reporting to the Ministry of Justice. Uh, they can put fines on NGOs of up to $4,000 euros. It's a very heavy fine uh, for an NGO to survive. So basically the idea was that they wanted to bankrupt those NGOs which receive foreign funding. And the political activity, my NGO, the previous NGO, uh, became foreign agent because I gave a lecture at the at Harvard Law School, uh, and uh, this lecture was about how we challenge Russian law, Russian legislation, in the Constitutional Court. That was considered a political activity. So uh, a lot of uh, it's very difficult. We can't accept foreign funding now. We have to survive somehow. Um, I'm curious to know, how does one become a judge in Russia? Uh, we know um, in America, we just saw Kavanaugh get onto the Supreme Court and what that entails, but I really don't know very much about how one becomes a judge. And yet their ideas, their authority, their place in the hierarchy, all of that seems so important. So I wonder if you could just briefly characterize how that how that sort of structure works? Um, <clears throat> if you want, uh, judges of the Constitutional Court are usually former professors. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very much generalizing. Uh, if you want to become a district court, all you need to, to do is to be a secretary, secretary of the court, and then you will be promoted. That's the most fast track to become a judge. Uh, usually, it's a prosecutor. It's never, it's never from the pool of litigators, unlike here, I, I guess. I'd be wrong, but it's always this way that just I described. So, 
those judges are not very much open-minded mm -hmm. or corporate corporate people mm -hmm. they're appointed uh they're appointed by the president mm -hmm. Uh, we'll take one more question. I was going to say this is the third lecture that Professor Burkoff has given today. Today. Wow. Yeah. So let's take one more question and let's give him a rest. But please go ahead. That's not to belittle your question. I want to yeah. hear it. So please. Uh, just to go off of the last question, um, and kind of to touch on your your like medicine conversation with, with one of the judges. Like, do you personally believe that a lot of the judges do want to um, improve? like the way that the law is interpreted in Russia in terms of human rights, or do you think that, and, and do you think that there is some kind of external force preventing them from doing so? Well, there is a very strong internal force preventing them to rule in favor of how they feel they should rule. It's a distance salary. Um, so they don't want to lose this. That's that's very easy. <laughs> uh, maybe some of them are waiting. They are. Um, they have these incentives, not only good salary, but uh, uh, they can be giving housing for free. Imagine somebody is giving you a flat <laughs> in few years to come, and you are thinking whether to rule in, in favor of Sabrina or. Yeah. But don't worry about me being giving third <laughs> lecture. He promised me frozen margarita afterwards. <laughs> so I have this incentive to go on. And maybe. Every 10 questions, is, it's another margarita. So <laughs> <laughs> I look at, she wants some to drink. Go ahead. I'll use this. So I look at this title, Sablina and Others versus Russia, and it makes me think that it's all about the Russian government in a way, right? And so recently I've read a piece of news that now like now the law has been issued that any um, statement against Russian government is illegal and it will trigger some punishment in a way. I'm just wondering how this may affect your case. Oh, you now know how they will apply the, the new law. Uh, it's mostly a chilling effect. Uh, but this is a very formal name versus Russia can call it other ways. It's basically not against Russia, but against some uh, state-owned uh, medical institutions and how the court functioned. Uh, it's, I, I, w I would not like to try to predict how this new law will influence. I guess people will be more careful, like now they're more careful by clicking likes or reposting news because many of uh, many many people were convicted for liking some news about Ukraine or reposting um, really for two or three years of imprisonment one like and you're there so it's it's very uh, it's very dangerous I don't know how to affect affect us. I hope so. I hope to find more students to follow, especially with now online tools. Are there any other questions? Right, it's just a couple of margaritas, that's all you got. And that was great, Anton. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming, everybody. I hope you enjoy. And I uh, really thank you, Anton. Really into the expression of Slavic studies first. If you want to write an email, ask something, please, uh, there's the contacts. Awesome. <laughs>